uh, room for a really good treat this afternoon. Um, obviously, we've got Michael Rosen, um, who, as I said this morning, needs no introduction whatsoever. Michael is a professor of children's literature and one of Britain's most loved writers and performance poets. So please put a warm welcome together for Michael. Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, today I thought I'd talk mostly around the idea that uh, through poetry and narrative in poetry, story in poetry, uh, that we can excite children about story, about poetry, and about reading, and about performing. And I see that all as one kind of continuity between them, between the reading, the telling, the performing, the writing, um, and that poetry offers us a fantastic bridge. I mean, of all the things that poetry offers in terms of the way it helps us think about certain things, it's a fantastic bridge between what we might call the oral and the written. Because I sometimes think that one of, the, one of the problems that children have with literacy is to make the connection that this stuff that we do when we write is actually connected to how we speak. The two worlds for a child must seem very, very different if you think about it. That you run about in the playground or your mum says goodnight or somebody says ta and these things, and then there are these books where the stuff that you say during the day doesn't seem to quite tally with the things you're reading, as if it's somehow or other, not in another language, but in another dialect. It's as if somehow or other you've got to do some kind of translation between the two. And so I often think, well, part of learning to read and knowing what reading is, is to be able to do the translation because it is different, and there's lots of ways it's different. So just to be technical about it for a moment, that when we speak to each other, we interrupt each other, we don't finish sentences, we talk in mini sentences, we say yes, no, I don't know, we grunt to each other, we go, yeah, yeah, uh, all right, yeah. All that stuff. Also, we hesitate a lot, even when you listen to the radio. If you just listen for a bit, you'll hear people repeating things, not finishing sentences. And when we write, it's a much more organized thing. So, for example, when we write, you may not be aware of it, but you're much more inclined to what's called front load a sentence. In other words, put in front of the main bit of what you're going to say, stuff to do with when and where and how and in the beginning and all the rest of it. Some of you who teach year six will have heard of uh, fronted adverbials. Well, uh, that thing of fronting, we do when we write much more than when we speak. When we speak, we like to get straight to it. We just talk about the cat. We don't say, when I saw the cat, it. We just go straight to the cat. Yeah? And then also, when we speak, we use a lot more pronouns. You know, Michael walked into the room. He was wearing a hat. So, you know, we do a lot of he, she, and it stuff when we speak because we were just there. We can point to people and go, she, he and that sort of thing, or it, meaning the floor. We can just say that, all right? But when we write, we have to be more specific. <laughs> so imagine you're a child. You've got to figure this all out at the same time as you're doing all that other stuff to do with decoding and which uh, grapheme corresponds to which phoneme, all that stuff, which whatever level that you're thinking <laughs> that stuff through, you've got to do all this other thing that I'm talking about at the same time. So I think that poetry offers a fantastic way to make the bridge, because poetry can be very informal, it can sometimes be in a spoken voice, but something else that's backing poetry is that it's what I call, a very technical word, it's got lots of hooks in it. So in other words, you hear it and you go, oh, I like the sound of that. It's got some little bit that's bringing me in, and it may be the rhythm and it may be the rhyme. You know as well as I do that if you do a little rhyme or a rhythm, or indeed, if you watch the older kids learning raps, learning how to say somebody like Stormzy or somebody like that, and they can learn it, or maybe they know football chants, that that's what poetry offers. It has this musicality, there's a posh word for that, prosody, but it has this musicality about it that makes it very attractive and easy to remember. So if you've got chunks of language that are easy to remember, that's like portable gold. You're walking around with chunks that you can then see written down. So there's a this bridge that I keep talking about. You can relate the performance to the written. 
and from the written to the performance just a bit more easily than say with a whole story well of course you can you sometimes see someone uh, telling a story or something like that and then you find the text of it but the advantage of poems is they're short and you can perform them and then you can glance down and you can see it on the page or you can go and hear a poet and then you can go and find the poems and so and it's the same with songs as well you can learn a song and then you just find the words relate the words to the song so I often think a fantastically powerful assistance for literacy and for enjoyment of literacy and what it can offer poems and songs are fantastic used to that um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little story uh, I was out with some boys and girls by the side of the River Thames in London and we've been doing a poetry workshop together um, what we I'd had about 300 of them sometimes you teachers you set me nice problems you say do a poetry workshop with 300 children why not that's nice and easy um, and so we were by the River Thames and we were in this room overlooking the Thames and the Festival Hall if you know it and so I had this idea that we could get a wallpaper lining paper and we could spread it along this whole great big long wall and each of the children I was thinking could make up a verse could make up something and it wouldn't have to rhyme but it would just be like a, a conversation if you like between somebody or something so I'm thinking this through and then as I often do and I, I'm going to connect with this in a minute often find the resources in quite old children's books and old folk literature and there's an old tradition in folk music in fact of question and answer or of two people or two objects talking to each other it's quite a long tradition and please beg borrow or steal it from me uh, it's a fantastic cue for writing and so as we were by the River Thames we were right by, right by the London Eye I don't know whether you know it so there's the big London Eye and the River Thames next to it and I thought oh great the, the London Eye could be talking to the River Thames the River Thames could be talking to the London Eye it's something that children can immediately the moment you release it you can tell them and say have a look have a look at that you know what would they say to each other and you just get them talking to each other for a little bit talking to writing you get them talking say well what would the London Eye say to the river and what would the river say to the London Eye and soon they were coming up with things about how the London Eye would be jealous of the river because the river can flow all the way out to the sea and then vice versa um, the river could be jealous of the London Eye because it's right up there and it goes round and it can see right the way out over London whereas me poor old river I'm just stuck in the mud here you know drifting along slowly and then they could talk about the boats and they could talk about the people in the pods and so suddenly they had lots and lots of things that these two objects could say to each other and of course that lies in a very old tradition of riddling that's to say that objects we say can speak and then you have to sort of guess what's special about them so if I say to you uh, I go around the world but I stay in the corner I am a stamp. I'm a stamp that's right I'm a postage stamp <laughs> yes I go around the world but I stay in the corner and that's a lovely paradox that's the word I often teach children that all these riddles that you do there's some sort of paradox almost a kind of joke element in them and soon they were thinking about this and they wrote all this lovely great big poem and some of it because I, I if you like release the idea they can speak onto the page so that's what you can do in poetry you encourage children I quite often say you talk with the pen you talk with whatever they write with so you can talk with the pen um, and that's what somebody told me when I was quite young and so you don't feel that you're going into writing mode you're just talking so you can say you I mean, so the London I could say you to the river and the uh, the river can say you to the London Eye without getting into a whole paraphernalia about the London Eyes whirling around above me so they can get me very direct about it again that's what poetry can offer so it's like a mini drama yeah so we were doing all this and then it was all over and it was very nice and uh, we went off in various directions and um, uh, I was walking along by the side of the river and there's one of the bridges is in fact a railway bridge and you walk under it it's called Hungford Bridge and you walk under it now you'll know probably better than me that if you have 30 children and you walk under a railway bridge and a train goes over there is a law it's, it's in the Bible I think I'm not sure where it is but there is a rule that if you're under a railway bridge and a train goes over all 30 children will go I'm sure you can do it ah! it's written down somewhere I don't know where it is written down but that's what they all did and uh, there's something inside of me I, in fact it's my parents I have two parents two, had two parents uh, both teachers 
And so I have sort of two little featurey people sitting inside my head. So when something like this happens, I have a slight tendency to kind of go into teacher mode. And you'll know if you have 30 children screaming, one of the things that will cross your mind is, I wonder if there's something else they could do other than scream. <laughs> and so I thought, well, yeah, you can see and hear the train. And I said this to them. But you know, if you put your hands over here on the bridge, you can feel the train. Yeah. So we all went over, so instead of screaming, we've now got 30 children, Michael Rosen and two or three teachers and stuff, standing there going, <laughs> didn't look strange at all. And we're standing there waiting for the next train, and the train came past, and sure enough, we could feel the train. Now then, slight switch of mode. When, if you'd studied poetry at college or at any time since, quite often the word inspiration crops up. And I'm not against the word, but I think it does need a little bit of handling. That's to say, it was an idea that really came with the Romantic poets. Maybe you studied those at school, Keats and uh, Shelley and Byron, that sort of people. And they very much liked the idea that instead of there being reason, you have inspiration. So I'm not against it, but it's just that those of us who write know that a little bit of it is inspiration, but quite a lot of it is just sort of, how can I call it? It's, it's more like scavenging. It's more like, I see, rather than inspiration, I see myself as a crow. And what crows do, if you watch them, is basically they just go about eating anything. You know, like you watch them and they're in the middle of the road and you wonder what it is they found in the middle of the road. Is it a bit of a dead fox? You know, and they're pecking away and then they move off somewhere else and then it's a, a berry and then they kind of go and eat a leaf. Well, in a way, writers are a bit like that. We're scavengers. We look for anything that is of any use that might trigger off what we might write with. And of course, one of the great things to write with are bits of words that hang about. And if you look around you and in the environment and you're listening, there it is for the writer crow to grab hold of. Yes? So when I see in your classrooms, and I know a lot of you have these wow words up on the wall, I have a little twinge inside me and I go, well, okay, wow words. In fact, I happen to think that all words are wow words, but never mind, the great word. <laughs> really good, I'd have that up there, the, okay. Um, but there's another wall you could have where you were crows, and you can tell the children, be crows, be like crows. You could watch a crow out on, in, the, in the road, and then you could say, Let's us, let us be crows with words and language. We can collect it wherever we find it. We could collect it from an Adele song, we could collect it from something funny that Nana said. We could collect it from a book, where there was a really great bit in a book. We could collect it from something that the head teacher said in assembly, and so on. And so we could have like a, a crow wall where you just collected bits, and then you change it as and when you want to. And you know, you can feed in things, and maybe there's some children in your class who speak other languages, so they could bring in things like that and explain to the rest of the class what it means. I was brought up in a, in a home where uh, my parents uh, spoke quite a lot of another language. I never quite knew what was English and what was in this other language, which is Yiddish, as some Jewish people speak. And so I, they're words that I don't really, well, I didn't really know the English word for it until later. So I thought that the word for the thing you dry up with is schmutter. And I thought that was the English word. I mean, I just, I just thought that's what it is. It's a schmutter. I go to school and I say to my friends, hey, you know when you... You know, your mum makes you dry up with a schmutter, you know, and they go, what's a schmutter? And I'd go, what are the thing you dry up with? They go, no, 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 it's a tea towel. And I went, is it? I go home, mum, mum, my friends at school say that the thing you dry up is a tea towel. Mum said, no, it's a schmutter. <laughs> Thanks, mum, that was really helpful, yeah. Or again, mum, you see, she'd walk into our room and she'd say, this place, it's a mission monk. I'd say, mum, what's, what's a mission monk? She'd say, well, this room, and then walk out. As far as I'm concerned, a messy room is a Misha de Monk. If you say, what does a Misha de Monk mean? I'd just say my bedroom. <laughs> I mean, I suppose it means other things as well, but I have no other definition for it. I have no other word for grandmother for most of my childhood other than Bubba. You have Bubba, and the grandfather is Zayda, and that's who they were. And I mean, if you say, well, what's the word for granny or grandmother? So I would sometimes blurt these things out. So, you know, I could have put that, or I could put Misha de Monk on the wall, if you think, if I'd known. I thought it was probably an English word anyway, but... So you could have this word wall, if you like, or call it a crow's wall, and feed in things. You know, when you find things that you think are interesting, you do it, but you encourage all the children to do it. 
and to collect orally. It's quite important. That's again, this is I the idea of the bridge. Okay, what's it? We're still standing by the, the, the railway bridge, by the way, just in case you want. So, so we're still there. Okay, so we've got our hands on the bridge, and I'm thinking, hands on the bridge, because one of the things you can scavenge as a writer is yourself. Because you come out with things, and you think, whoa, I could use that. Okay, so you take a new attitude to your own oracy and your own literacy. The moment you start doing this, it places you in a different relationship to language, that not that you're just simply a receiver or a transmitter without thinking about it, it makes you monitor it. So that's the advantage of doing this. So here I am now, we're all standing there, and I've said hands on the bridge, and you can feel the rhythm of the train thinking, whoa, hands on the bridge, feel the rhythm of the train. So another little thought comes into my mind, this all happens a bit split secondly, is that sometimes when you write poems, and, and stories as well, but particularly in poems, is you can write things that sound like the thing you're talking about. So you can write a poem about the sea, yeah, and it can sound like the sea, particularly if it's got lots of susses and slushes and whooshes and whatever. And it doesn't have to be onomatopoeic, because it could be see the sea, see the sand, see the sand, see the sea slap. So you can use words to make poems so they sound like the thing that you're talking about. So could I, as I'm thinking hands on the bridge, and you can feel the rhythm of the train, I'm thinking, could I make up a rhythm poem that has got a very strong rhythm to it? All right, could I do that? So, still standing here, hands on the bridge, feel the rhythm of the train. Hands on the bridge, feel the rhythm of the train. Another split second thought comes into my mind. I was once interviewing the poet Benjamin Zephaniah on the radio, and my producer told me, ask Benjamin where he writes his poems. Okay, so I said, Benjamin, where do you write your poems? And Benjamin said, how do you mean write? <coughs> Thanks, Benjamin, that's all you ever want when you're an interviewer, <laughs> when the interviewee throws the question back at you, and your mouth goes dry, uh, particularly if it's live, I don't think it was, but anyway, and your mouth goes dry, and you go, oh, oh. you'll sometimes see interviewers do it, you know, it's quite funny, I always laugh, because I'm thinking, ha ha, we got you, not me. Anyway, so thanks, Benjamin, I thought you were a friend. Um, anyway, and, he, and then he, he was very kind, because he then went on to explain, he said, well, I don't actually write my poems, I make them up in my head. Do you? Yeah, he said, I make them up when I go jogging. And so then, when I get to the end of the jog, I know the poem off by heart. Brilliant, stage writing. You just make it up, you're jogging. He runs like, you know, 400 miles a day. And uh, probably, probably not, but anyway, he does run a lot. And, uh, and so he makes them up in his head and he says, not only that, if you make up a poem in your head, the poem will be in the kind of shape that when you say it to people, they can join in and they'll sort of know it very quickly. So this is part of the magic of, if you like, the folk tradition. Further digression. The book, we're going on a bear hunt, you may have heard of it. Okay, if you p open it, sorry if you just pass me that copy, I, I do know it off by heart, sorry, I'm just going to show you something, <laughs> just in case you worry. If you notice inside here, uh, he said, turning over the beautiful painting by Helen Oxbury, it says there, retold by Michael Rosen. And the reason why it says that is because this was a kind of folk song. If, in America, I wouldn't need to be saying this, because it was like an American folk song that children used to do on summer camp. Yeah, you know, summer camp, we're going on summer camp, and group leaders in summer camp would go, we're going on a bear hunt, we're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day. And I changed that to, we're going on a bear hunt, we're going to get nets on. So anyway, I did change it. I changed various bits of it. But the point about that is that that developed orally. And that's partly why and how it works, because it's again the bridge from the oral to the written. That's Little Rabbit Foo Foo and some other books I've done, which I'll tell you about. So again, it's the bridge that enables children to get hold of it almost before they know they've got hold of it. So people send me videos of their 18-month-year-olds going, can't go over, mm, got to go through. And they grab hold of this little 18 months who can hardly, hardly talk, literally, as well as, you know, 83-year-olds uh, doing it. Um, uh, or indeed me, I, I'm 73, so, you know. Um, so 
that's what's that's the advantage of this kind of oral way of writing that I'm talking about. So we're still there. Okay, we're still there. <laughs> <laughs> so hands on the bridge, feel the rhythm train. These split second thoughts are coming to me. I'm thinking of Benjamin. I think, well. Could I make up a poem that begins like that, that's going to be like about rhythm on my way home? So sure enough, check my hands off the wall now, and I'm heading off home. Say goodbye to the children. Okay, left the children with, left the teacher with screaming children, hard luck. And um, I don't have to do that. And so I headed off, and I'm then sitting on the tube train, going, hands on the bridge, feel the rhythm of the train. Hands on the window. Ah, yes, that's good. Hands on the bridge, feel the rhythm of the train. Hands on the window, feel the rhythm of the rain. Hands on your throat, feel the rhythm of your talk. Hands on your leg, feel the rhythm of your walk. Hand in the sea, feel the rhythm of the tide. Hand on your heart, feel the rhythm inside. Hand on the rhythm, feel the rhythm of the rhyme. Hand on your life, feel the rhythm of time. Hand on your life, feel the rhythm of time. What? Hand on your life, feel the rhythm of time. So, Benjamin Zephaniah challenge. <laughs> the Benjamin Zephaniah challenge now is you know that. Because that's what he said, didn't he? Benjamin said that if you make up a poem, you know it. And then when you perform it in front of people, then you'll all know it. So you know it now, don't you? <laughs> so we're going to perform it. <laughs> We're ready to roll, guys. We're ready to rock and roll. That's it. Here we go. So I will help you with it, all right? It begins one, two, three, four, and then we say, hands on the bridge, feel the rhythm of the train. Now, one other little thing here, uh, just before we start, all right? You'll know, many of you, particularly those of you who teach the youngest children, that if you move to a piece of writing, it helps you hold the writing in yourself. Because whatever you do, whether you're swaying or doing gestures, or even whether you're just with your face, all right, the word connects to the movement, connects to the body, and so you embody the words. Words can exist on a page, they can just exist in your head, that's fine. But remember, these, we're talking about children under the age of 11, you want these words to stick. And one way they can stick is for you to move to it. Why is karaoke so popular? You know, quite rightly, it's because you get the rhythm there, and then you go, da, 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 yeah, that's right, and then it's just coming. I love da, da, da. you know you can do it all. yeah and that's part of the fun of it isn't it so it's the same it should be the same with poetry all right and indeed with a lot of literacy connect it to the fact that you know we're not just beings who walk around with like a brain and nothing hanging down below all right we have these bodies so here we go one two three four Hand on the bridge, feel the rhythm of the train. Window. Hand on the window, feel the rhythm of the rain. Throat. Hands on your throat, feel the rhythm of your tall leg. Hands on your leg, feel the rhythm of your walk. Sea. Hands in the sea, feel the rhythm of the tide. Hands on your heart, feel the rhythm inside. Rhythm. Hands on the rhythm, feel the rhythm of the rhyme. Hands on your life, feel the rhythm of time. Again. Hands on your life, feel the rhythm of time. What? Hands on your life, feel the rhythm of time. Woo! <laughs> so, in a way, it's as simple as that. All right? And then, if you want to, you can write it down. Or indeed, you can find a copy of it. I've written it down in a variety of places. It's in a book called... Uh, Michael's Big Book of Bad Things, I think, is where I put it there. It's not a bad thing, but anyway, it's happened to have turned up in that book. Uh, or you can just write it down, or you can see me performing it on YouTube, and then just scribble it down yourselves. You can put it up on the wall, you know it off by heart. You might find that you'll start changing it. And you might say to the children, oh, we can make up something like that. It's the most dynamic, powerful thing to get children writing is to kind of shrug it off and just say, yeah, well, we can make up something like that. That's dead easy. All right? And then you just say, well, look, you just change bits. It's like Lego. You imagine that each word is a different colored piece of Lego. And then when it's repeated, so it's when you build Lego, and then you can just take out that bit and put in another bit. So it could be, you could change it. So it could be feet on the ground feel the rhythm of the ball. Oh, wow, yeah, that's right. Feet in the, on the floor feel the rhythm of the hall. It's the dinner hall. So you say maybe fit at the dinner hall. And suddenly, you're moving things round, and you can make up new stuff. And that's only doing what writing is, which is using all the words and texts that came before to create new stuff. And so again, you're connecting talk with reading and writing and listening, that holistic thing. Yes? 
So you can do that just with one very simple poem. Yeah? So that's where I'm starting from, if you like. But if you say, well, where does all this stuff start from? So I'm going to have a little digression in history. We quite often think, and obviously, you know, you're looking at a living writer, but we rest on the shoulders of writers before. And of course, there's lots and lots of writing and writing before. And so I just thought I'd remind you, uh, this is my Bible. This is a book called The Oxford Dictionary of Nursery Rhymes. All right, borrow it from the library. Every library has a copy of this. Do borrow it because the wonderful thing about it is it's a history of how people like you and people like me from about 1500 to about 1900 tried to engage children in the idea that learning to read and reading can be fun. So it's a very, how can I put it, a very populist, very kind kind of a book. And if you're interested in the scholarship of it, you can see exactly where these things come from. And when I read it, and I've known it for 40, 50 years as a book, in fact, I think, <coughs> yes, it says here inside, BBC TV, Play School, room E601, <laughs> East Tower. Seems as if somebody or other walked off with this book <laughs> when he was working for Play School, which some of you are too young to know what it is, but Play School was a TV program um, that used to have two presenters and they uh, had a little bit of music and then they appeared and they would go, hello, <laughs> hello, <laughs> look what we've got. It's an egg box. Watch. And now it's Upside down. Is it upside down? Yes, it is. It's upside down. <laughs> Shall we sing the upside down song? Yes, Brian, let's. I'm upside down. Anyway, yes, I used to, I used to write to play school. Yeah, um, anyway. So, no, I was there for about a year in 1971. And um, I, clearly I thought they had too many copies of, of this. And I just want to read you just one or two. They'll be, you know, they'll be familiar to you or not. And just to remind us of some of the principles by which somebody like me uh, writes. So here I look, it's just a simple little rhyme. Once I saw a little bird come hop, 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 and I cried, little bird, will you stop, stop, stop? I was going to the window to say, how do you do? But he shook his little tail and away he flew. So what you, re what you get with these little nursery rhymes are little dramas, and they're child-sized dramas, and that's why they've survived, because... From 1744, it's as early as that, that the world's first nursery rhyme book happened for children, directly for children. 1744, a little book called Tommy Thumb's Pretty Song Book. If it interests you, go to the British Library. It's on display there. There are only two copies of it in the world, and they've never found volume one. So you're looking at volume two of Tommy Thumb's, Tommy Thumb's uh, little, Pretty Little Song Book. Yeah? And that was the world's first nursery rhyme, and it's a great reminder, and it says in the back specifically, if you'd like to teach children how to read and not beat them, there's a little rhyme there, and not beat them, because they thought beating was one of the ways in which children learned how to read, because you beat the words into them, you see? That's how it's what they, that was a reading theory. We've moved on a little bit since then, not a lot, but anyway. So the idea was that maybe if they read these things, they would actually find them funny and interesting and want to read them again and again. So there's this, it's the first example of Sing a Song Sixpence being written down. In actual fact, in their version, it's not blackbirds that are in the pie, but boys, mm. as well known. So boys live in the pies. But anyway, so there, it, so there I get the idea of a little drama, but also that repetition. Come hop, 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 will you stop, stop, stop? So, you know, you know the word phonics. Uh, but also the idea of rhyme and repetition this crucial aspect, which of course is in phonics education, but of course it's also in ev almost every pop song that you've ever heard, is repetition. And it's repetition because that gives you a rhythm, and the rhythm invites you to do repetition, and then the word sticks in your head, and you relate what you hear to what you read, and what you read to what you hear. All right, so just one or two others, okay? So you may know this one, you remember? Sing, sing, what shall I sing? The cats ran away with the pudding string. Do, do, what shall I do? The cat has bitten it quite in two. Tiny little drama. Yes, it, it seems so trivial to us as adults, and yet actually when you hear people talking on buses, that's exactly what they do. You never guess what the cat did. 
And then they'll tell you something the cat did, you know, and everybody's bored apart from you because you're terribly excited. It's your cat and you think it's really lovely. And you go, so you never made. It was amazing. The cat waggled an ear. And the other person's going, right, yeah, no, it's really interesting. <laughs> but you see, that's what, you know, our lives are made up of these little dramas. And these poems and these kinds of poems connect with the dramas that the, the children have. We're along with the repetition, along with the rhyme, along with, along with um, the, the shape of the thing as well. The fact that you've got a question and an answer and a question and an answer, a bit like I was saying about the, the uh, London Eye and the river, that these structures quite often in these poems involve a question and answer so you can dramatise them when you work with the children. If you just took this one, sing, sing, what shall I sing? The cat's run away with the pudding string. Do, do, what shall I do? The cat has bitten it quite in two. Divide your class in half. One half says one bit, the other half says the other. Swap over. One side asks the question, the other side turns. You can actually make a chorus to it, so you could just go, do, 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 or do, do, what shall I do, 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 what shall I do? And that is what uh, jazz, jazzers will call rhythm and bass. That's the ground in a pop song. So you can always take the children and use the resource of the children to make a chorus. You can do these improvised, or you can take any poem you like that's got a rhythm to it. You take out a couple of words and use that as the rhythm of the poem, and that's exactly the same as musicians do with the bass guitar and the drum, and then the others do the solos. It's exactly the same principle. If ever you work with jazzers and jazz musicians of any sort, they'll go, give me a, and they'll either say a riff or give me a, whatever they do say, but anyway, give me a riff, they sometimes say, and then the, the bass and the drum will go, that's the ground, that's the bed, they also call it in pop music and so on. And then you can, and, and then the, the soloist, which might be the guitar and let's say the sax, will then take the melody. You can do exactly the same with poetry. You can do it in choral singing as well. You've seen it in a cappella songs. Somebody sits there going, dum, 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 dum. Remember a long time ago, the flying pickets, that's what they used to do. And you can do it as well. Gospel singing is based on that quite often. There's no, no instrument, you can do that. All right, so that's the kind of thing as well. Um, oh, I don't know, here's another one. There was a man and his name was Dob and he had a wife and her name was Mob and he had a dog and he called it Bob and she had a cat called Chitterabob. Cobb says Dob, Chitterabob says Mob. Cobb was Dob's dog and Chitterabob, Mob's cat. So it becomes a tongue twister, which again is part of the fun of it. And you've got, look, you, I mean, if you think, you know, phonics didn't mention, didn't, didn't invent this Dob, Mob, Cobb stuff. You know, there you've got your your consonant vowel consonant right there in a nursery rhyme that was first written down in 18, 1817, I think. So this idea, this runs through, you know, a long tradition of stuff. So you're, when you do this stuff, you, you're drawing on a long tradition. You may well be overlapping with the folk cultures of the people in your class, no matter what country they come from. Because every country has its tradition of lullabies, and uh, little work songs, one sort or another, and little rhymes, little jokey rhymes about the weather. You know, if you think it's raining, uh, you know, what's the one about the sky? You know, uh, go on, you tell me. Uh, it's, it, red sky at no. shepherds. No. Red sky in the no. shepherds. No. There you go, you all know it, all right? You possibly have never seen that written down. So on your word wall tomorrow morning that you're going to create, you could put that up, couldn't you? And your kids can say, well, why'd you do that? And you say, well, I don't know, I just know it. Yeah? 30 days has September, all the rest I can't remember. That's a well-known one, that one. Yeah. So, uh, now I just want to connect with some of the things that I write um, as, a, as a way, if you like. So, I don't know whether you know this one, the bus is for us. And so, when I write, I try, particularly for young ones, I try to incorporate these ideas. And also, one of the great things about rhyme, of course, is that you... You're doing that key thing that I know some of you have to do anyway. It's called prediction, right? You have to do a prediction of narrative, and it's no bad thing because it's quite interesting that if you stop any narrative halfway through, and after all, we do that when we watch telly every time they do a series and we sit there guessing something about it. You know, so if you've got a six-parter, you know, by the time you get to the third part and you think, well, is he the baddie or the goodie, and is she the baddie or the goodie? Oh, they're all bad. All oh, right, it's one of those, is it? Um, so, in fact, you know, when we do that with children, that's in a way no bad thing. If you think of Dickens, so Dickens' great novels, Great Expectations and Bleak House and all the rest of it, they were in installments. In fact, Dickens himself didn't know how to finish the book. He was writing it while they were coming out. 
So in fact, it was quite an interesting thing to do with writing. But the great thing about rhyme is that, of course, you, you predict it. Down behind the dustbin, I met a dog called Jim. He didn't know me, and I didn't know him. And I was in a school not long ago, and I said that. I do it quite confidently. See, so I come in and go, can you help me with this, folks? I, I sometimes forget the last word. You know, it's quite a corny thing, but I do it. Anyway, I go, down behind the dustbin, I met a dog called Jim. He didn't know me, and I didn't know him. And the boy shouted out from the back, well, how do you know his name was Jim then? <laughs> and I went, um... Uh, no, sorry, I don't know, actually. Yeah. Down behind the dustbin, I met a dog called Sid. He could smell a bone inside, but he couldn't lift the... Lid. Yeah, well, he was a dog, wasn't he? Dogs don't lift lids. Why, why are you telling me this rubbish? Down behind the dustbin, I met that dog called Sid. He said he didn't know me, but I'm pretty sure he... Did. That was a lying dog. Down behind the dustbin, I met a dog called Barry. He tried to lift the bin, but it was too heavy to... Dogs don't lift bins. This is just rubbish. <laughs> Down behind the dustbin, I met a dog called Nicola. She looked a bit like an onion. So I thought that I would pick her. Somebody said tickle her. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I find that, that usually with an audience of children, it's about half and half there. One half will go tickle her. And then I say, have you ever seen a tickled onion? <laughs> and then, of course, in fact, they have, you know, because then I then enact a tickled onion for them. And I go, hee! Anyway, never mind that. Down behind the dustbin, London one, this one. Down behind the dustbin, I met a dog called Louisa, and there was another dog there, and she was trying to... Please. Squeeze her. Yeah, you need a London accent for that one. Down behind the dustbin, I met a dog called Felicity. <laughs> it's a bit dark down here, because they cut off my... <laughs> And again, if I do that with very young children, nearly always it comes out as down behind the dust when I met a dog called Felicity. It's a bit dark down here because they cut off my... And there's always a little group who go, tail. Because <laughs> obviously it would be dark, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, something like that. So that's the nice thing about, and a thing about rhyme. Uh, we don't have to stick with rhyme, but if we have got it, is it, you've got that nice prediction thing. So here we go. I really like... To ride my... Bye. Lovely, very good. There we are. And there, the picture even helps. I know you're not supposed to do that. I, Nick Gibb explained to me why you're not supposed to do that. He also explained to me, by the way, that you mustn't give uh, children aged four, three, four or five picture books because it would confuse them. I thought, what am I doing here? I'm, I'm, oh, golly, I've been confusing kids for years. <laughs> I like going far in our car, exactly. That's very good. When it starts to rain, I like the... Rain. Very good. You are. You're, you're hot. You are. That's good. <laughs> but best is the bus. The bus is for us. And there you can see the children getting on the bus. I do, of course, like riding a... Horse. You do. That's right. My dad, actually, um, this is some very old, very old silly rhyme that my dad used to say, which was, I know two things about a horse. I've forgotten them, of course. And he used to say this, my dad, and then he explained that when he went to university, he had to study something called Old Norse, okay, which is Icelandic, which influenced our language, English, you see. And he could never remember any of it, so he adapted it to, I know two things about Old Norse. I have forgotten them, of course, exactly. I like to float in a little... Boat. You're right. I like trips in big... You don't even need to look at the pictures, do you? You're good. But best is the bus, the bus is for us. Sometimes I wish I could ride on a fish. We can make it happen, can't we, here? If I was allowed, this is a little bit kind of woo, a bit away with the fairies, this. If I was allowed, I'd sit on a cloud, you would. I wandered lonely as one of them once. I'd be all right up high on a kite, that's it. But best is the bus, the bus is for us. I'd love to play in an open very good, a little bit of a lift from Jingle Bells there. Fly to the moon in a hot air balloon. Or for a dare, ride on a... Dare. You're right, good. But even so, the bus is best. Best is the bus. That's because the bus is for... Us. us. There we go. Yes, actually, I should have said, do feel free to pronounce those words your way. I do have to say that when I arrive in schools. If I do another little poem with you. Um, that when I arrive in schools is to explain to the children that though they're saying what I say, they don't have to say it in my way. So I explain as I move north of Watford that I say bath, 
but you can say it however you like. And I say, how do you say it? And then all the kids go, bath. And the teachers go, I don't think we do, do we? And they go, oh, no. And the teacher might say, no, we say bath. So they go, oh, yeah, so we do. Yeah. The trouble is, big Michael Rosenthal's up going bath, and they all feel they have to go bath, even though they've never said bath in all their lives. And I must just tell you this, that I've done occasionally visits to America, which is very nice and very fun. Nobody's ever heard of me, and it's, it's quite interesting. And, and one place I was in was uh, in California, uh, sort of Southern California, which is very largely Hispanic. And I went into a school, and I said something to somebody, I think in the staff room, and I said, banana. And they said, what? And I said, banana. And they said, what's that? And I said, you know, the fruit. You eat it here, don't you? It's yellow. Did you peel it? And they went, oh, no, no, man, that's a banana. <laughs> and then they laughed. And I thought, I've got a gag here. So I went out, and I started doing my poems to the kids. And I said, oh, hang on a minute. I'm really trying to learn American, OK? And I'm not doing very well. What do you call that yellow fruit that's sort of like that? And you peel it, and then you eat it. And it's soft, and it's sweet. And so the kids are going, banana particularly with Hispanic accents, so they go, banana. And I said, do you know what we call that in England? And they went, no, they said, apple, no, no. And I said, banana. It's the best joke I've ever told. <laughs> they couldn't believe that anyone would be so crazy and mad to walk around calling a banana a banana. <laughs> and they all walked around for the day, I, while I was in the school, walking around going, eh, banana, like that, pointing at me. I've never had a joke as good as that. So anyway, so uh, here's a little poem that I do with children. And in fact, you know, people, I, quite often when I sort of, if I'm interviewed on the radio, people say to me, of course, children don't do poems anymore. They don't learn poems anymore. And I say, well, it's funny because I've been touring schools for over 40 years. And when I go into schools, I just do a poem and then I do it in a way and then they say it back to me. So as far as I know, they learn a poem every time I've been anywhere. So this is the poem I do with quite young ones. And uh, first of all, we look at our hands, so you can look at your hands, all right, and then we do this, yep, and then you pull that through, and then you put your fingers up on the side of your nose, and you don't have to talk with that silly voice, some of you aren't doing it, because you're already embarrassed, okay, and then what you're going to do in a minute is open your hands without taking your fingers off your face, look at the person next to you, okay, and then open your hands without taking your fingers, oh no, some of you are cheating, he's got stuck there, there's a whole sort of sticking thing. Just try it one more time. It's quite simple. Pull it through. Look at the person. No cheating, guys. Fingers up by the side of the face. And open it up. Simple as that. No, unbelievable cheating there. It's all right. I'm, see I'm here. I can see it. Some people going like this. You know, no, it's that one. You've got to cross over. There is a simple trick. You'll be able to work it out. It'll take you about about six weeks to work out what the trick is. Uh, I'll explain, it is in the way you mingle at the beginning. You have two choices. You can do it with that finger on top or that finger on top. Just experiment, try it with that way, try it with that way, and then you'll see, it's science. Okay, so in fact, you can do a scientific experiment with your children as to what it is. No, you got it, yeah, no, you're stuck there, that guy there. Yeah, never mind. So we do that, and then I say, put your thumb in the air, and your finger over there, and find your other thumb. It's probably on the end of your other arm. And then you put that thumb on the end of your finger. Missed it. That finger on the end of your thumb. You've got a telly now. Put your ear on the telly. And that program is called What's This Ear? And then you can put your cheek on the telly. And that program is called Don't Be Cheeky. And you can put your nose on the telly. And that program is called could be called Don't Be Nosy, or it could be that program that comes on at 10 o'clock at night, the 10 o'clock nose. <laughs> and then what we do is we do that together. So we establish a rhythm. So we say over here, so what do we start with? The ear. What's this ear? Don't be cheeky. Don't be nosy. 10 o'clock nose. Can you do that with me? One, two, three. And what's this ear? Don't be cheeky. Don't be nosy. 10 o'clock nose. Lovely. So I establish a rhythm with them. And then I say, well, right, now we're going to do a poem, and you can say it after me. So we'll do this exactly as I do it. This is the hand, is the hand that touched the frost, that, touched the frost that, froze my that froze my tongue. Ow! Ow. And made it go numb. Made it go numb. And as little children quite often don't know what numb means, I explain to them. That's when your tongue is so cold you can't feel it. And here we go again. This is the hand, is the hand that cracked the nut. 
that went in my mouth and never came out. This is the hand that slid round the bath to find the soap that wouldn't float. This is the hand on the hot water bottle. Ah, he 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 he. Meant to warm my bed, meant to warm my bed, but got lost instead. But got lost instead. So this is the hand that held the bottle, let go of the soap, that cracked the nut, that touched the frost. This is the hand that never gets lost. And there it is, stuck on the end of my arm. And I lost the feeling in my tongue. And then I lost the nut, didn't I? And then I lost the soap, and I lost the hot water bottle, but I still got my hand. And now we're all going to do that together. And we know it off by heart. So one, two, three. This is the hand that touched the frost, that froze my tongue and made it go numb. This is the hand that cracked the nut, that went in my mouth and never came out. This is the hand that slid round the bath to find the soap that wouldn't float. This is the hand on the hot water bottle. Ha! He 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 he. Meant to warm my bed, but got lost instead. So this is the hand that held the bottle, let go of the soap, that cracked the nut, that touched the frost. This is the hand that this is the hand that this is the hand that hey there we are hey and again if you want to make the connection and of course I'm very keen on that is you can make the connection you can either write it down yourself so you can see you can show the children that you can write down what you say or alternatively here is a little book and in the book there's the poem and there's some Quentin Blake pictures and there's a boy feeling the frost on the window and the nut, he's just throwing the nut in the air and then he's in the bath and what does he do with the hot water bottle? Oh, I know, the boy's, he can't see him, he's only he's his foot and there he is in bed and you can show them that and there's a connection between the oral and the written and the written and the oral and the performance all in one, yeah? So I tell you what, let me stop there just for the moment, see if any of you got any questions before I talk some more, because some of you may have some things. Why not talk to the person next to you for a minute and see whether you've got anything that you want to say to each other, first of all, any questions you'd like to raise about anything I've said, and then we'll recycle that and you can say it, fire it back to me. <laughs> Has anyone got any thoughts they would like to share? Any questions directly to me or any puzzles, anything that concerns them? Anything at all. Be, be nice and bold. You've just been speaking loads and loads, so you've got lots you've been thinking about and saying. All right. Please feel free. You're amongst friends. Yes. So we've got non-verbal children at our school, and we thought they would be able to follow that um, active and then we would be able to just have their comprehension, or at least part of their comprehension. If they're able to follow the act, then we might be able to work out how much they understand, so what, what would be sort of like in the findings of the yeah. Now, when you say non-verbal, um, as a little alarm bell goes off in my head, I work, one of my hats that I wear is I'm uh, a teacher, you saw professor, it says there very nicely. Uh, I teach an MA in children's literature at Goldsmiths University of London, and we have uh, a term which is called children's literature in action. And in that term, I supervise people like you, who we call them students because they're doing an MA, all right, but they're nearly all practicing teachers, and what they do is try to find ways of working with children that engages them in books at whatever level they're at. So they might be nursery, they might go all the way through to uh, teaching GCSEs and A-levels. So what ways can they engage children in text? And sometimes the teachers do come in and say, well, I've got a group who are underachieving or they're nonverbal and all the rest of it. And then I say, well, are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? All right, so I'm not saying they're not, but I'm saying that one of the best ways to find out whether children are or are not uh, nonverbal is not to ask them any questions, but to sit them down with something, whatever it is, that might engage them. It might be a comic, it might be a bit of Lego, it might be something or other where there is something or other to talk about. It might be a wordless picture book. 
So some of you will know the wordless picture books by Sean Tan, or you might know Quentin Blake's Clown, and you ask the children to tell the story. Or you might take a picture book that's, that has got, like, if you like, problems or questions. I think maybe you're going to show some of those in a minute. Where it's not immediately clear what it means. So without anticipating, but somebody like Anthony Brown, who I think you're going to hear from in a minute, you look at the Anthony Brown books and it's like, what? He hasn't got feet. His feet look like something else. So immediately there are problems when you just look at the picture. If you take even a book that we all know called Where the Wild Things Are, and you say to, so I had one of my students taught three-year-olds and four-year-olds, and she said she found it very difficult to just simply come in with the book and read it to them. And so she thought, so how, what, what's going wrong? She said it seems as if they're just not interested in stories. She said a few years ago she used to come in, just do a story, and they look, were interested. Now she holds up the book, and there's already a few kids, you know, you've got Velcro, that's really interesting. God, you've got some of your partings in your hair, it's really interesting. We all know that, we've all been there. Um, and, and she said she needed to do something different. So what she was going to do was to bring in a book and then show them the pictures and ask the children to say what they thought the story was about. So she's got three and four year olds, some of whom are not, English is not their first language, and she found that she couldn't stop them. So she completely reversed the situation because she posed a problem that they needed to solve with language. And they found some language, yeah? So she, for example, she showed them where the wild things are. And you'll know one of the pictures, in the, one of the pictures very early on in the book, is a picture of a, a, a kind of clothesline and something hanging over the clothesline. Um, and there's a teddy bear being hanged from a, a clothes hanger. And so the children, so the children immediately said, it's a slide, it's a slide. So what she did was record them and showed us the transcript. She brought the transcripts in, so these children who, you know, some of them speaking another language other than English originally, all right, going, it's a slide, it's a slide. And then somebody said, no, it's, it's a, I don't know whether they used the word, a clothesline. They said, it's hanging there to get dry. And then one of the children said, oh, it's a towel. So when you look back at the picture, it's not quite clear what it is. So they said, so all these are all legitimate questions. It's a towel and it's getting dry. And then one of them posed the problem, well, what's the teddy doing there? And somebody said, the teddy got magicked outside, got wet, it's come back in, and it's getting dry. So I take that as one very simple example of three-year-olds, not very verbal, but they're using a picture, they're using their knowledge, after all, that's a basic piece of scientific knowledge that we might not think necessarily three-year-olds know, that if you hang things up, they're wet, and then they get dry. So they're using story as part of their cognitive apparatus. In other words, that's science, yeah? They're also using a bit of fantasy that the teddy bear's magicked out, magic back in again. No harm with that, because after all, there's magic in where the wild things are. So we can't just say, well, no, we don't do magic here, actually, darlings, because, you know, we turn over two pages and there's a forest growing in the bedroom. So as we know. So there's an interesting thing and they're talking and debating they turned over the page and in the next page max if you remember is in a wolf suit and he's running down the stairs i forgot what's in his hands but there's a dog and the dog is going out the door looking a little bit worried so these children then look at that and they say that the boy's not being nice to the dog and he's got pointy feet if you remember from the picture he's in his wolf suit and the wolf suit looks actually around the feet area quite realistic and they were sympathetic with the dog. So they've moved from the child to the dog, which is a key thing in children's books. The animals are quite often surrogate children, and the children are surrogate parents. There's a quite interesting thing goes on in picture books where children swap roles. If you think of Dogger, for example, the Shirley Hughes, you know, why do children care about Dogger? Well, partly because they fear that they might be Dogger. Yeah, they never say that, or oh, I might be sold and put in the jumble sale, but, you know, that's the thought, right? And that's the, the power of stories that we give to children where the core idea in it is detachment and attachment. There's a very powerful theme that runs through an enormous amount of children's books which are about parental detachment, attachment, child detachment, attachment. Those of you who've had babies will know that you read your 
uh, Hugh Jolly or your Bowlby or whatever, and in those books they said, you know, who decides when you detach from a young child? Is it the child or is it you? All right, I can very clear memory of going, which one of my children it was, and I arrived at the hospital, okay, on the second day or whatever it was uh, after the baby was born. I was there at the birth, it's okay. Uh, I can see you all looking at me. Blimey, you didn't get there till the second day. Where were you, chum? I suppose watching, watching Arsenal Spurs probably. Yeah, no, I was there at the birth of all my children, thank you. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so it was a day or two later and I picked the baby up and the nurse walked in and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm picking up babies. She said, no, no, we, we don't pick up the babies. Must have been the first day, actually. So she said, we don't pick up the babies. I said, no, I do. I said, I'm the dad. She said, no, 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 you might drop the baby. I said, I've had three other kids. I've never dropped a baby. Okay, well, once. Okay, I did. Yeah, but anyway. <laughs> and anyway, they bounce. It's all right. She said, no, 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 but it's just a rod for your own back. I said, what? She said, no, no, if you pick up the baby, it'll always want to be picked up. I said, yeah, what's the matter with that? I said, they like that. They like it. Look, look, the baby likes it. Look, look. And she looked at me like I was some like maniac, that I was holding my baby, you know? Attachment, detachment. It's very powerful. Anyway, so children, and a lot of children's books, think of Dogger, think of any of these books. Where the wild things are, who detaches? The mum. She sends the baby to his bedroom. Okay, then when he gets there, he wants to be loved. He wants to be where someone loved him best of all. He's seeking attachment. But mu the only thing that mum's ever done is detach, as far as the book is concerned. So is it mum who loves him best of all, or someone? Deep thought. He gets back, and there's a symbol of attachment. The meal is there. The meal is there. It's, it's still hot. But who gave him the meal? Could have been one of the wild things. Could have been anybody. Very strangely, it's not the mum. There's no mum's hand delivering it. If the child wants to think it's mum, they will. They interpret it. Even a two-year-old or a three-year-old might say, that was mummy. Whatever, what mine did that. Excuse me. All right. So all these books have, you know, many meanings. It's like an onion. You start peeling it off, and the children are thinking of these things. And then when they're looking at these pictures, back with my student. All right. So in this picture, they started getting worried about the dog. And on she went, and they talked. They talked and talked and talked. Children who she had never heard talk like that. She brought the transcripts in because she was inviting them to interpret pictures. That was, of its own, a, like a switch. So children who had been bored, I mean, she, she, she was saying this, not me, who had been bored when she held up a book and said, right, today we're going to look at where the wild things are. Once upon a time, there was a boy called Max. That suddenly they wanted to solve the problem of the pictures. So, your children may well be nonverbal. I'm not saying they're not, but it's quite nice to see for your own benefit what they can do so you get a kind of <laughs> baseline of your own to see what it is they can do when you create the propitious circumstances for them to talk, yeah? And then, as you say, when you do poems that, that in a way stick to them, whatever they are, and what I say, the best way to find that out, how old are yours? Yeah. Um, very, very limited. Right. If you, if you did rhythm, yes. he, he will come along with Brilliant. Rhythm. So you know that he's getting there and he's not yes. picking up words, especially words that would make a sound. Yes. So you've got a confound word, maybe yeah. he can start to repeat that. Brilliant. He's seven or eight now. Yeah. So I'll say this about autistic kids or kids Asperger's on the spectrum and all the rest of it, is I get letters every week from all over the world, would you believe, from parents of autistic kids who tell me, all right, this sounds like gross boasting, but I promise you I, why it isn't. Okay, is that children and autistic kids of all ages and autistic adults have discovered my YouTube channel and there is this maniac on there <coughs> called Michael Rosen who when he tells poems, he gestures with the rhythm of the poem and when he says he's happy, his eyeballs go like that. <laughs> and when he's sad, he goes like mm. And, you know, any other world, it's called overacting. <coughs> or if you want to be kind of theatrical about it, it's got names like Grand Guignol, as the French would call it. So I've devised a method of performance that is an exaggerated performance. I don't know why or how I've done that, 
Well, partly I know it because I, when I very first went out and started performing poems in schools, the only kind of way I knew how to do it was a bit because I've heard poems on the radio. And when you hear poems on the radio, you've got that kind of radio voice. I should know because I work in radio. So, you know, where someone would go, you know, I wandered lonely as a cloud. And it's that kind of voice, you know, I know you all will a while uphold your unyoked humour of your idleness. And I thought, sort of, that's how you had to say poems, even though I'd written something like, the ship in the dock was at the end of the trip, the man on board was the captain of the ship, the name of the man was old Ben Brown, he played the ukulele with his trousers down. So, very profound poem that I wrote, uh, based partly on a folk rhyme again, all right, and I put it in a book, and I got invited to a school. I got invited to a school called Princess Frederica in Kensal Rise, would you believe? So I arrived at the school, and the deputy head who took me in was a guy from the west coast of Ireland, Sean McElain, never forget him. And he said, oh, Michael, Michael, he said, it's wonderful that you've come. It's absolutely marvellous that you've come. The children love your poems. We've been performing them all week. They're just desperate to see you. And like those old London schools where you've got the school hall and the classrooms off the school and the deputy head study and the head study. And he opened the room, opened the door to his room, and there was the whole school. I'd only ever read my poems at this stage, 1974, to about three kids at a time. And on the radio performing them like that, you see. And suddenly, there's 400, whatever it was, London school kids who give you about four and a half seconds. And if you haven't got them in four and a half seconds, you've lost them to the Velcro. They're there. <laughs> this is so interesting, the Velcro. <laughs> Have you seen my Velcro? <laughs> my Velcro's, oh, it's not as good as your Velcro. <laughs> it's much more interesting than some bleary old white guy standing up in the front going, ooh, I've got a poem here, and it goes like this. Anyway, I started doing this, and Sean, I could see him now, to my, you know, he's over there to my right, and he looked at me with horror on his face. He thought, he got this book that I'd written, and he thought I was some kind of live wire bloke, and here was this dreary guy, and in fact, as I remember it, I actually held the book up in front of my face in case they saw me, <laughs> like this. So I was reciting the poem, you know, radio-like from behind here. And he suddenly, I, I don't think he let me get past just a, a, more than a couple of lines, and he went, no, it doesn't go like that, does it, boys and girls? And this great roar from 400 kids came back going, no, you know, flat me against the school hall wall, you know. <laughs> and he said, shall we show Michael how it goes? And I went, yeah, that'd be great. And then the whole school recited this poem, and it actually they didn't recite it, they danced it. They went, the ship in the docks at the end of the trip. The man on board was the captain of the ship. The name of the man was old Ben Brown. He played the ukulele with his trousers. Down with his trousers. Down. They did a whole little riff on trousers. Down. Trousers. Down. Like that. And I'm going... <laughs> and at the time, I was also, on top of all that, hypothyroid. So I had an underactive thyroid. So when I went like that, in fact, I went... <laughs> and I'm not joking. Okay, so I was actually half dead as well. So watch it, it's, it's true, I, you think I'm joking, but anyway. So I'm watching this, and that moment then reminded me, because I'd done a lot of acting when I was a kid and all the rest of it, and been to a kind of acting class. I thought, oh, you act the poems. And then through performance, and I get these letters from Wisconsin. I've got an autistic boy that's never said anything. He watches you for hours on end, and then he performs them. He's never performed anything before in his life, and now he does. So all I can say, with absolutely no expertise whatsoever, other than just arriving at this by luck and by chance, and I, also I see this when I go into halls and uh, special needs teachers bring in the autistic kids, and I've learned about this, is that they sometimes sit there uh, shouting while I'm doing it. And what they're doing is imitating me. So I'll go, you know, uh, down behind the dustbin, and I hear, down the dustbin, like this. And, I'm, and at first, you know, actually, usually the kids are already accustomed to it, and so on, and they may stay in for the whole session or for some of it. And it's because of this infectiousness of the rhythm, the rhyme, the gesture, the face, which applies to all children, but as it happens particularly to kids on the spectrum, because... I did a half-hour program, please listen to it. I'm interviewing someone with autism on uh, word of mouth. So if you put in BBC, Radio 4, word of mouth, Michael Rosen, autism, 
or BBC Radio 4, Autism, Michael Rosen, or any of those things in the field, you'll hear a half-hour interview with me, with someone on the autistic spectrum who runs a magazine for autistic people called Curly Hair, because she's got curly hair, and she explains to me all about autism and also uh, if it's possible for me to stop talking, because I'm talking too fast and also uh, she gets anxious if the time goes over. So she tells me to shut up, which is quite nice, <laughs> on radio, it's quite good, it's good love radio. But she explains about the difficulty that autistic kids have of reading our faces. It's as simple as that, that a lot of kids have no idea what we're thinking. They assume one thing and another, so quite often by the time they get to four, they think we're all lying. Because people go, yeah, no, I'm really happy. <laughs> or, oh, oh, yeah, he died. I'm really sad. And they go, well, why are you looking like that? And they can't read it. Because Brits traditionally, or many of us, you know, we don't say, I'm really happy! <laughs> oh, no, I'm really sad. We don't do that. I mean, other cultures, you go to Italy, you wonder why they're all waving their hands in the air. You know, why are they going, hey, I went to Naples, and I could, we're in the street, everyone's going like this. And they're going, you bravissimo, like that. And you go, why are they, why are they doing that? And anyway, it's in the culture, you know. So uh, I th whether autistic kids find it a bit easier to cope in Italy or not, I don't know. There's no science behind that. So there we are. Uh, so yes, use this rhythm and face and so on. We have to try and be clear for our autistic friends. I have to shut up. A lady held up a zero a moment ago. It just reminded me a little bit of the British entry in Eurovision. <laughs> Nul point, Michel Rosen, nul point. Merci, madame, pour le zéro. Thank you very much for the zéro. Uh, so, thank you very much. I hope you've had a nice time. Write a rap for Stormzy? Uh, I don't know. I doubt whether he needs one. I have got a little. It was my birthday this month, and it was my birthday party yesterday. My birthday is, in fact, the 7th of May. And somebody said, Well, why don't you do a poem about your birthday? And I said, Well, I have actually got one that goes, I was born on the 7th of May. I remember very well that awful day. I was in my mother, curled up tight, though I have to say it was as dark as night. Nothing to do, didn't have to breathe. I was so happy, didn't want to leave. Suddenly I hear some people give a shout, one push Mrs. Rosen and he'll be out. I'm telling you all, that's a puzzle to me. I shouted out, how do you know I'm a he? The doctor shouted, good Lord, he can talk. I popped out my head, said, now watch me walk. I <laughs> anyway, there you go.